David Patrick Kelly. David, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure, Dan. Thank you very much. Honored to be here. So, Commando is celebrating its 30th anniversary this year. Now, how did you originally get involved with Commando? Well, I've done uh, films with Larry Gordon and Joel Silver, uh, The Warriors, and 48 Hours. And uh, they were the producers of Commando. So they just called me up and asked me to do it. It's awesome. Oh, yeah. And I'm, I want to say, sir, that with a tremendous amount of appreciation and respect, that you are one of cinema's all-time greatest sleazeballs. <laughs> and I would love to know, like, did, did you, how did you end up in these roles, and w did you fully embrace it? Uh, well, you know, you never, you never try to think of yourself that way, although, you know, I'm, I'm a guy who rebels against the kind of... Uh, actor studio uh, situation um, because I like to tell the larger story, you know, and I like to, you know, it's not just about the psychology of that character. And, uh, you know, so if, if you know, I, I, I like to call characters as I see them. Uh, if they're evil, then I want to try to make that evil part of the story come clear, you know, and, um, but uh, there's a fascination with that because it's not who you are. You know, if you grow up a, a, a nice kind of a, a Catholic boy from Detroit, you know, you're kind of <laughs> fascinated by the dark side and you want to see, you know, uh, go places that you wouldn't go before and, and, and help to tell the story, you know. Um, uh, so that that's how it came about. And, and they've all been a great distance from me, you know, whether it's Luther and the 48 Hours or... Uh, the Warriors or uh, Commando, those early things, or Tommy Ray in uh, Dreamscape, um, uh, and on and on. Right now, I'm I'm on Blacklist, uh, playing uh, uh, gun running gang, you know, and uh, you know, so it's it's an interesting part of history, and you can you can sort of really reflect the times that we're living in. You know, that Commando was was part of the Reagan era. You know, and, and uh, Arnold was sort of the id monster of uh, Reagan's uh, political consciousness. You know, he was sort of saying, you know, we're going to be uh, in control of uh, of the world, and uh, this is how it's run. You know, if I have to take care of policing the world on my own, I will do it. You know, and uh, and he, he showed that in in, in that movie, but. You know, there were so many people involved in it, really great, Joel and, and Lawrence Gordon, of course, Joel Silver, the producer, and uh, Stephen D'Souza, who wrote the screenplay, you know, and allowed me to improvise a lot of the dialogue to make, you know, to make the character uh, uh, more, you know, just more human, to have more backstory. And, um, uh, and James Horner went on to win... Academy Award for Titanic, you know, wrote the score for that, and um, so a lot of fascinating people involved in in, in Commando, uh, and the reason that it holds up for a lot of different reasons. Absolutely, and and it's it's so great to know that you got to improv a lot of that. Uh, that character, uh, Sully, is, is is just so great, and and the interactions you you have on screen, uh, you know, with every character that you're involved with, is it, there's just you can tell there's a little piece of you just having fun with that role and just really wanting to kind of push the envelope and things that you say. Uh, where does Sully rank in your list of the bad guys that you've played? Well, I, it's not a, a ranking. They're always, you know, those guys, you know, Lawrence Gordon, Joel Silver, produ uh, you know, produced some things that were, were fascinating um, because they reflected the times, you know, and, and, and this was 85, 1985. And it was before 
um, I ran Contra broke, you know, and it was before, you know, the, the U S and, and Russia were still playing this huge chess game, you know? And so to be able to use the character and, and for that character, I based it on mercenaries, you know, for, mm-hmm. for Sully, the character in that, uh, I based it on mercenaries that worked for the, 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 the very, you know, use the word sleazy, uh, um, uh, sort of um, money laundering guy, Robert Vesco, who was an investor in different political campaigns, and then he went on the lam. Uh, I think he passed away. You know, he went down in those uh, Central American countries, and he ended up in Cuba for a while. And but I saw an interview in 60 Minutes with two mercenaries that worked for him, you know, uh, two former U.S. military guys that were charged with protecting him, getting paid. So... Um, he's, you know, Sully is based on those kind of guys, you know, and they're, to this day, there are many, many mercenaries around the world, you know, sort of using their, their training, uh, for, for different political ends, you know, and, and, uh, to enrich themselves, you know, and, um, so, uh, so he's up there, Sully's up there on the, you know, in my rogues, rogues gallery, you know, my gang was the rogues and, uh, it was sort of, uh, a predictor of uh, what was going to go on with uh, my career so far, you know, and um, uh, although I've been very blessed and played a lot of different characters on stage, uh, you know, Shakespearean characters and good guys, bad guys, just finished four years in the musical once on Broadway where I play a sweet uh, father of the guy. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's been, it's been really cool. And it's very fun and creative to be able to, to tell these other stories too, you know, so, but Luther, the Luthers and uh, Sully and the Tommy Ray Glattman and the Horn Brothers are, are kind of villainous, I guess, in Twin Peaks. And uh, uh, on and on, right now I'm playing a guy named Henrik Gerst in uh, The Blacklist, <laughs> who's uh, part of a gun running gang, you know. And um, so um, uh, those are some of uh, some of the Rogues Gallery there. That's awesome. That is great, and you know I think one of the one of the best lines in Commando is uh, when Arnold looks at you and tells you that he's going to kill you last. <laughs> and uh, well, he was full of shit, <laughs> <laughs> and you had a, a fantastic death. Yeah, yeah, there were you know I I always identified a lot with uh, stunt guys, you know, and and uh, Benny Dobbins, the late Benny Dobbins, who. Passed away, uh, I think he had a heart attack when he was do- uh, doing the movie called Red Heat with Walter Hill and uh, Arnold. And uh, But he was a great uh, stunt guy, you know, and I, uh, I've been lucky to work with some great ones. Jeff Imada did Dreamscape and The Crow, mm-hmm. and uh, and Benny Dobbins did 48 Hours. And uh, and so when Arnold was holding me, you know, and I'm, I'm sorry to be a spoiler here, folks, but he didn't really hold me. There was a big... <laughs> crane that uh, had a cable that was going up my legs and uh and benny dobbins um let me use his his venerable stuntman's belt he had this leather tooled uh stuntman's belt because in the 50s he did he did westerns and there was a famous trick that the stuntman had in those westerns where they played the native americans uh the indians and they'd get pulled off the horses, you know, when the cowboy heroes would shoot them. And uh, the stuntman's trick was called the one-legged jerk-off. And they got, <laughs> you know, they, they were pulled on a wire uh, down their leg, and they got pulled off their horses. And uh, and that was the the the, uh, the trick. So so I was honored to use uh, uh, Benny Dobbins' uh, leather tool that had his name on it. It was like, uh, you know, Elvis's guitar strap or something like that. You know, it... Uh, it was beautiful, and um, and he worked with me on Forty Eight Hours as well, and uh, and on and on. The stunt guys are great, right up to John Wick, uh, where Chad uh, Stelsky and and David Leach uh, were the directors of John Wick, and and you know these are these great stuntmen, you know who um, who know what it's like to be in a life and death struggle because they've dedicated their lives to martial arts and. And uh, so that's why John Wick is so fascinating to me, you know, because it looks like a ballet, you know, these guys in business suits fighting each other, you know, and, um, you know, so, uh, uh, you know, I've I've always uh, had a great time with some guy, Alan Graff, who did Last Man Standing, 
you know, uh, in some of the Hangover movies, you know, he's uh, he's a big uh, USC linebacker who worked uh, for uh, Walter Hill over and over, and uh, he did Last Man Standing with me, and uh, and I was honored to get a stuntman's pin for that <laughs> because I I did my own stunts in that, and oh and nice, fell fell down when they when they got me, and uh, and they gave me a stuntman's pin for that. That's really awesome, and, and I was very happily surprised to find out that you were in John Wick. That, that was that was a, a neat little treat there. Um, and, and we're 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 admirers of stuntmen and people that do their own stunts. We we uh, a couple months ago we had on Al Leong, who of course is a uh, great legendary stuntman, martial artist. Uh, was in Die Hard and, and a lot of those great movies, and. Uh, he got to work with Brandon Lee in a film, and, and you also got to work with Brandon Lee as well. Uh, that, that, yeah. that was pretty cool. Yeah, it was very cool. I, you know, I met Brandon, and I said, you know, your father was a big influence on me, and he said, me too. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, we um, were going to work out together. You know, I was just going for my first black belt at that time. And, uh, but we were good method actors, you know, and we didn't talk much to each other because we wanted to keep the tension real. And, uh, and he was a great guy and, uh, and really, uh, wonderful. He worked so hard on the crow, you know, it was uh, such a terrible tragedy. And, uh, you know, we finished it for him. That's why we, we finished the crow. We, you know, we, everybody was going to walk away. We could have walked away and the actors got together and we said, we've got to do this, you know, and, uh. And Alex Flores, the, the director, you know, brought us back together and we finished it for, for Brandon. And, uh, but he was, he was, uh, he, he was really a, an inspiring guy. Really, really cool. Yeah, I think it's great that you finished the film because it, it really left a huge imprint. And it's really one of the defining films of the 90s, hands down. Yeah, you know? it? I, I call it the, the rebel without a cause for that generation, you know. It, it kind of hit the point where grunge rock was coming in, you know, and, uh, and, um, you know, it, it, it has a, this uh, amazing score. I think it was the number one score, you know, with, uh, with uh, I'm trying to think of the bands that were in it. Uh, oh, I mean, bands. there's some great bands. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Nine Inch Nails and The, the Cure. Nine Nine Cure. Cure. Yeah. And... Was Pearl Jam out? I don't think they were out. Well, but, Pearl, um... Pearl Jam wasn't. I mean, but that, that soundtrack, uh, Rollins Band, yeah, it, it's such such a Rage Against the Machine. Still holds up. It's it's really great. So we actually did an episode, a whole episode dedicated to the Crow soundtrack uh, <laughs> last year because uh, uh, it's just so great. Yeah. yeah, The Cure. The Cure is on there, and uh, they wrote that specific song for it and everything else. And uh, I never forget uh, Robert Smith's quote. You know, he said that uh, that he liked it better than Batman, you know, The Crow. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know? For him, it spoke more personally to him the situation you know and uh so uh yeah lots of lots of recommend about the crow you know it was uh it was a hard shoot it was cold down there it was cold in wilmington north carolina and it was you know um you know but things went great and, and everybody got along and it, it, you know there, there was a lot of wonderful work done in that and it's, it's so sad that it had to be a terrible tragedy like that yeah but um Rock on, and uh, and uh, thirty years. I can't believe it flashed by for Commando. I and, know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, well, you mentioned earlier you, that you do have actually a very good stage career, and you know, you know, you played Iago in Othello, who's one of my favorite Shakespeare characters. What is it that draws you to to stage that you love compared to doing movies? Well, it, it's not that you're in charge totally, but you are set free. You know, and you get two hours and you get to be with an audience. And it's sort of a, you know, as a, a wonderful director, Tom O'Horgan, once said, it, it's it's an appointment in time with the senses. And, uh, you know, where uh, you get to be with an audience, however big it is, anywhere from 100 people uh, to 1,000, you know. And, uh, and you get to tell the story. And it's also about poetry. You know, it's the, uh, it's the highest achievements of the human mind, you know, uh, whether it's Shakespeare, Moliere, the great Greek tragedies, or um, uh, contemporary uh, playwrights and, and, and poets, you know, that's that's what it's about, you know, and language, you know. Um, uh, other actors have said before that the stage is about language and, uh, and um, you know, movies are about sound and light and image. And, 
and so it, it's dealing with language, you know, because language is, is one of the highest achievements uh, of human consciousness, you know, and, it, and so much resides in there, you know, and um, and so that's what it's about, and, and being able to, to tell a story of Shakespeare, you know, um, uh, is so inspired, and I'm I'm a believer that if you're in touch with the greatest achievements, if you if, if you get to work on them, you know that you you get to share in that creative genius, you know whether it's Shakespeare, Moliere, or Chekhov, or uh, you know some of the other wonderful things I've been able to do. Um, you get to share in that. You get to share with an audience, and you all say, okay, this is the meaning of existence. This is why we're here. <laughs> you know, and uh, uh, you know a, a young friend of mine who. Um, let's say, how do I say this delicately, uh, imbibes of particular substances, said to me, uh, what, you don't, uh, you don't do any, uh, you know, drinking or smoking or anything? And I say, no, no, because I get high on the existential epiphanies. You know, that's really... <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> uh, th- there's too much in life that's, you know, but uh, if you're awake and alert to it, that you can enjoy it, you know, and you don't need anything else. That's so great. Uh, you mentioned before about uh, getting into martial arts. W- when did that passion for martial arts start in your life? Well, you know, I, I, I think it's another actor's discipline. You know, I, I went full-fledged into acting at 18, 19, you know, and uh, that's when I got my first union job. And so it it really became a passion, you know, in reading everything. And to be honest, I... One of the large reasons I got into martial arts was be, to be able to play Shakespearean generals. I wanted that real experience to know what that was like, to be able to convey that. You know, but before that, I'd done a lot of things. I'd trained in Paris as a mime. You know, I know mimes get a lot of disrespect, but whoever, you know, it's not intelligent criticism because mime is really fantastic. And my great maestro, Marcel Marceau, taught me so much in my generation, you know, in the in the late sixties, early seventies, when we were in college and studying to be actors, it was all about physical stuff, inspired by rock and roll. You know, some of the greatest theater I saw, I saw Jimi Hendrix live. You know, I saw The Doors live. I saw The Beatles live. You know, and uh, that stuff was so amazing, it's gigantic theater. You know, and uh, so we were all inspired by circus arts and mime and you know rock and roll. And uh, so I went to Paris studied there and then came back and, and you can see it a little bit in, in the different film roles, you know, whether it's Three Bottles and the Warriors mm-hmm. or Jumping Through the Window and Dreamscape or, or uh, you know, just the little physical things that you can add to it. And so you get, you get, you know, unleashed when you're on stage. You get to use that total thing, you know, and, um, um, you know, so uh, um, I kind of lost my training <laughs> because <laughs> you guys have taken me back through my life. So, um, <laughs> oh, it's completely but, um, cool, yeah. I mean, again, you know, uh, I'm assuming just on, on different films, you probably even picked up some, some martial arts things just being on the set. I oh, know, the martial I, arts. I, I, I know, I know yeah, like, uh, like Ar- Arnold learned uh, a ton of martial arts on the set of Commando. He, he had to learn those things on the set, so I'm sure you picked some of those things up uh, along the way, but when, when did you, like, really just start to, like, say, I'm going to dedicate myself. I'm going to be, you know, go get my black belts. Well, I guess I went back. I started telling you about the mime and everything because it was mm-hmm. amazing physical discipline. We studied ballet, modern dance, acrobatics, fencing, you know, a, a magnificent martial art. And so then it, it, I wanted to play Shakespeare in general, and I wanted that real thing. And so I just got involved in it. And, and it, it, you know, once you get involved, you're really hooked because it doesn't start to look like anything until you spend a lot of years doing it, you know. <laughs> and uh, and the reality is much different than than uh, than you see in movies. Even Keanu Reeves will tell you he only knows uh, movie uh, karate. Right. You know, he doesn't right. know the real stuff. The real stuff is... Is much more difficult. You know, it takes three years to get your fist, three years to get your stand, three years to get your punch. That's what they say. And uh, so I did it about twenty years. You know, and got a couple of black belts, a couple of grades on the black belt, and uh, and uh, uh, so it, it's it's just a great thing spiritually and physically. You know, it'll keep you fit. I'm sixty four now. You know, and it, and um, doing pretty good. You know, and uh, it really keeps you fit, and uh, and it's very effective and it helps you when. Movies, you know, movies are tough. You gotta, it's all day long, you know, from four in the morning until late at night, and uh, and you gotta have some stamina and, and some grit, and, uh, and so it helps you a lot. 
in that. And uh, and it's just so fascinating. You know, I, I like uh, so many of the uh, martial arts movies. You know, they're really great. You know, I don't know if you saw The Grand Master recently or, you know, there's so, so many that go beyond... Uh, or the one about Bruce Lee's teacher, uh, Hip Man, you know. Oh, great, that's a great, great series. Great movies to watch, you know. And, um, you know, I, you know those forms, you can't touch it. And then it was blessed. One of my other inspirations is a great French actor named Art, Antonin Artaud. And Artaud inspired my generation, too, like rock and roll, the circus, and all these other things. Um, he was a poet, and he was a friend of the Surrealists. And, uh, and he was very, very much into physical discipline uh, of, of the acting, you know. And um, and uh, so uh, he was a big inspiration for that. And, and part of he had a list of things to do. And part of it was classic theater and part of that stuff that I told you about the inspiration of genius and great poetry. But he also had Asian theater techniques on there. And so I was lucky for about four or five years to work with some Chinese actors. And, you know... They don't kid around. They start from childhood, you know, <laughs> and uh, the techniques that they have are just totally amazing, you know. And uh, and so I, uh, you know, not only uh, Sado Karate, which is my dojo, but also uh, I spent a couple of years with the Shaolin teacher here down by NYU here and, uh, and learned some of that style of uh, technique. And um, and it's just endlessly fascinating. It goes on and on, you know. And I've been a long, long time practitioner of Tai Chi, which is great for many, many reasons. And uh, you know, uh, it's just enriching. It's a whole other world, you know, when you when you plunge into different cultures and and uh, you know, it's 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 fascinating. It's awesome. I had read a while back that one of uh, the biggest creative influences for you was a mandolin that you received as a kid. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I, you know, I grew up in Detroit, east side of Detroit, and on uh, St. Patrick's Day, uh, my mother gave me this mandolin. Uh, we just walked by it on our way to church one morning, and I, and she saved up and bought me this mandolin. And so all through high school in the mid-60s to the end of the 60s, I, um, I played the mandolin, but I didn't play any bluegrass or anything like that. I played uh, the Beatles and Motown, which is the <laughs> dominant musical style of that time. So I played it like a rhythm guitar and learned uh, the basics of the mandolin. And then, uh, you know, it, it got me into show business. Actually, I would audition with that for different musicals. And I'm a musical theater guy. I started in here and then right up to the Tony Award winning once on Broadway, you know, and... Uh, it's always, you know, I made a stop uh, in the early 70s at uh, CBGB and uh, and learned a lot of stuff there. And, and playing in cabarets and playing in clubs is a really great school as well. And uh, and it was a great time to be there when Talking Heads and Ramones and, and television and, uh, and on and on, great uh, you know, songwriters and artists and players. And... Um, and my band, but I was always doing acting at the same time, so I had to stop my band, but I kept up my chops and I kept playing the mandolin. And that led me right up to once. Uh, I never really was involved in Irish music, uh, David Patrick Kelly, but once was my <laughs> first uh, Irish play, you know, uh, after 40 some years as an actor. And uh, it was really great. I mean, uh, Glenn Hansard is so terrific and, uh, and all that. Uh, uh, new Irish music is is really fantastic. But it plunged into the old stuff too. And uh and it was a really enriching experience, yeah. Uh and as a matter of fact though, um I sang an Irish song in Last Man Standing, which they didn't use because they didn't want the bad guy to sing. Huh. Um, <laughs> Walter Walter Hill is always trying to get me to sing, you know, even <laughs> Even when we improvised the uh, Warriors Come Out to Play, <laughs> you know, he, I said, you know, he said, there's nothing in the script. I just want you to make something up. And I said, what do you want me to do? He said, just sing something to him. You know, <laughs> but I was down at CBGB's at the time. And I said, well, this guy, you know, he's not going to spin. He's going to say it like this. So that's that's the way that came about. But um, on Last Night Standing, there was a wonderful actor named R.D. Call. He made 16 in State of Grace. He played... Uh, uh, Ed Harris's second in command, the State of Grace, and, uh, and he was my second in command in, in uh, Last Man Standing. And he gave me uh, Van Morrison's album. Um, I can't remember the name of the album, but on it was Raglan Road. 
a uh, great song, which I sang about 1,200 times over the past three years on Broadway <laughs> at once. And that's where I learned it first, was uh, because R.D. Call gave me that, because we played Irish Gangsters in Last Man Standing. And uh, I did a version of it, sang it right to Bruce Willis's face, but uh, they didn't use it in the movie. They, they just kept us talking like that, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, uh, you've worked a couple of times with, uh, David Lynch. You, you did, uh, Wild at Heart. You did, uh, the Twin Peaks series, as you mentioned before, uh, Jerry Horn. Uh, excited to see that, uh, Twin Peaks is coming back on TV? Oh, yeah. That was a great thing. It was like being in the Beatles for a couple of minutes there, you know. Um, you know, when it came out, it, was, it you didn't know what to expect, and I did uh, Wild at Heart with him and met David, uh, and he was a great guy. And he wrote me into Wild at Heart. I wasn't that wasn't that character wasn't in the script originally, and then he, he, uh, I'm pretty sure he he created Jerry Horn for me too, and then me in there uh, in Twin Peaks, and uh, he's just a delightful guy and really creative, and uh, and so it was thrilling to be part of that that show and that group, you know. Um, it was a, it was it was kind of a peak period for David. I mean, he, he continued. You know, he's nonstop, really. But he, you know, they won the the Palm Door at the Cannes Festival for Wild at Heart. You know, and uh, uh, and then uh, Twin Peaks opened. You know, and there's something about Twin Peaks, you know, that has all the elements of his other movies. But you know, it was in this very very commercial venture, so probably more people saw it in one time. Right. And these other movies, you know, right. because television was so huge at the time, still is, but it's kind of divided up now with all the different screens you can watch things on. <laughs> and uh, binge watching, uh, you know, has brought Twin Peaks back to oh, the whole right. Absolutely. generation, you know, where people sit down and watch the whole thing. So um, when I'd meet people after the show and once on Broadway, they come up and say, oh, Twin Peaks, so great, you know. So it's exciting. I, you know, I wish them well. Nobody's heard much. I hear some of the other actors talking too, as well, and said nobody called me. Nobody's called me. You know, from <laughs> David Duchovny and, and stuff like that. And I haven't heard from them either. But I think they're still in the midst of creating what it's going to be. Right. And, um, I mean, I, I, so, I, I, yeah, I hope they bring you back. I hope oh, you get, yeah. I, I hope you get that phone call uh, when, whatever it is, and they, they bring you back. Yeah, it'd be nice. You know, I got a big long white beard now, so it'd be great <laughs> to see Jerry Horn with a big long white beard. You know, uh, it, how. Where he's been hiding out for the past twenty five years. You know? <laughs> yeah, Jerry was definitely uh one of the highlights of the show for me. Like what what went into coming up with that character, like for you uh, as you played him, because he's such a, a unique character. Well, I'll tell you exactly, you know, was um it was it was sort of see, I have to sort of go back a little bit and I hope I don't lose my train about about this. We were talking about, you know, Commando being uh sort of the uh Reagan era uh, id monster, you know, um, uh, Arnold sort of representing that. And, uh, you know, I, I guess it, it, in, in the way I worked on that character, Sully, I was trying to get closer to my own politics was that, you know, I'm, I'm sort of a Kennedy era inspired Democrat guy. And, uh, um, you know, we, I, I saw John Kennedy speak in Detroit. You know, there's actually a photo with me and my high school friends watching Robert Kennedy speak. And um, so this is all by way to tell you that even the people that you admire for, for a lot of different reasons uh, are worthy in a democracy of satire. And so I always thought of the Horn Brothers as a kind of National Enquirer version of the Kennedy brothers. If you believe every bad thing <laughs> that was ever written about the Kennedy brothers, that's what the Horn brothers were. <laughs> and, uh, and that's how we went about it. We talked about it a little, you know, you can see in Wild at Heart, you can see in Barry Gifford's novel, uh, Wild at Heart, it's sort of this kind of pre and post Kennedy assassination novel, Wild at Heart, you know, it's sort of, how the world went kind of cuckoo after um, uh, that assassination, that that political milestone, you know, and uh, and so I think that somehow, subconsciously or not, that sort of plays into Lynch. She's about five years older than I am, and 
there's something about him that he's so kind of straight arrow 1950s and yet he's so wild at the same time. Um, and there's something in the demarcation of those two, you know, those two eras, um, before and after that, that plays out in his work, uh, you know, whether it's Blue Velvet or Wild at Heart or Twin Peaks, you know, and, um, and so that's uh, a little bit, we didn't talk so much about it, but that's a little bit what the, what the sort of uh, template was for those two brothers. That's awesome. That's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. You, you know, you just have such a fascinating life, David Patrick. <laughs> I tell you, I mean, this has been so awesome. Um, Nick, well, I appreciate it so much, you guys, uh, uh, you know, uh, talking Nick, you have the one last question, and I'll uh, yeah, get to the wrap-up. Yep. Are there any roles that you regret maybe not getting or turning down? No, you know, I, I think about that from time. I hear people talking about roles that they missed out on, roles that really have been no major ones like that for me. I didn't, you know, there's not things that I came close on or anything like that. I've always been this kind of, I don't want to say marginal, but, you know, I feel very blessed about it because I, I never lived in California. I like California very much. It's fun to go and visit and work there and stuff like that. But I never lived there. A lot of people that, that I know went out there and sort of did a billion episodes of TV and things like that and then sort of made their way up into show business. Uh, good friend's uh, wife once said a funny remark that you only can fail up in Hollywood, you know, and... Uh, uh, but I, I've always appreciated the fact that I've, I've been able to do wonderful stage roles and uh, and then play these characters in in these movies, you know. And I've been blessed by the the producers too that I've worked with and the directors too. These kind of these visionary guys, you know, Clint Eastwood. I got to play the president of the United States for him and Flags of Our Fathers and. You know, uh, uh, Spike Lee here in New York um, and Walter Hill uh, three or four times now. And uh, and um, so, you know, I, I, I don't get things like that. I have, you know, I'm writing a couple of scripts that I, I, I wish I could reveal to you, but I don't want to uh, <laughs> right now uh, that have more substantial film roles for me because I really like film. But um there's a couple of different kinds of characters, you know, sympathetic characters. So I was sorry to, to you know, <laughs> tell you. And I'm, I'm, I'm going for human sympathy or sometime in my life here. And um, <laughs> so there's a couple that I'm working on here uh, that I'm, that I'm uh, going to try to, to get done. And, uh, but no regrets, no. Like uh, Edith Piaf said, I don't regret. It's awesome. Oh, I, life is great. Yeah, it's so great. I mean, and you know, I always enjoy uh, the the films that you do, the the roles that you do, and and uh, I look forward to anything uh, that you pop. Sympathetic or not, sleazeball <laughs> sympathetic, I, I'll 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 be happy just to see you in more stuff. Uh, I'm, Thanks, dude. I, I'm 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 right here in Jersey. Uh, we're Jersey guys, so uh, I'm glad you stayed on the East Coast. Didn't uh, didn't fall for that temptation of uh, the warmth of California, <laughs> even though right now it probably would be better for us. But uh, I'm glad that you stayed on the East Coast. Uh, no, New Jersey's great. My wife's from New Jersey, and uh, New Jersey's great. Awesome. So uh, New York, the tri-state area, we'll let the little shout out for that. Yeah. <laughs> Appreciate the time, David Patrick. Thank I'm, you, sir. Life yeah, gentlemen, day. thanks. Thanks, great deal of thanks respect, and... Uh, Keep talking. Don't ever shut up. Absolutely, man. (laughs) Have, Have a great one. Thanks. Thank you.